everybody, and welcome to this brand new episode of The Geek <laughs> Buddies! <gasps> hey! hey! Yeah, for, yeah. for those of you listening to the podcast, you missed the dramatic turn and the jacketed, uh, sunglass-wearing Shannon McClung. Yeah. And even if you're watching, you might not know what's going on, because you weren't on the text chain last night where yeah. we found out that Shannon was drunk. Yes, for four hours uh, with one of the extras on Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. He was hanging out with him <laughs> drinking for four hours. And so uh, he is, uh, but he is here hanging out with us uh, to do a, a Geek Buddies. And we are very excited to jump into all the stuff that's going on here in the world of geekery. You know, we've, we've been kind of finding ourselves dropping these shows on Fridays. It's kind of working out for us. Uh, we'll see what more updates we might have with the show going forward, but certainly. Friday seems to be a day that we've kind of organically settled on here because a lot of stuff drops and we were getting a little upset about being behind the eight ball when other when this stuff drops near the end of the week and not being able to talk about it. So hopefully nothing massive drops uh, before you guys get to watch. Well, now show. that you said it. Yeah. Right. Everybody get ready. Some some big news coming today as <laughs> soon as Michael we post Keaton this. Batman trilogy. Uh, yeah, that's really <laughs> possible. Uh, but we're going to get into a bunch of new trailers. Uh, speaking of upcoming stuff uh, that we're going to talk about here, we're also going to talk about some box office tracking for The Flash and Elemental. We're going to get into the first reactions for Across the Spider-Verse that's just about to come out here in just a few days. And also, we're going to get into our main topic, which is the state of Marvel right now with a lot of things in flux, cancellations, controversies, uh, writers falling off, new directors being considered, old directors being considered, a lot of stuff happening in the state of Marvel. So that's going to be our main topic. And the way the show works is each of us brings up a, uh, a topic here to discuss and then we take a, a break uh, a couple of times throughout the show and then we get into our main topic which is as I say it is going to be the Marvel stuff but let's introduce ourselves for those who might not know us I am the outlaw John Roker writer producer and host here on the Geek Buddies I am Michael Vogel a writer and producer of animated TV shows and movies and uh feeling great this morning woke up just feeling jumped out of bed feeling just like ready to ready to take on the day it's the summer of Vogel it's the summer of Vogel <laughs> And this is Shannon McClung. I'm an actor and an animation writer. <laughs> and to clarify, I wasn't drunk for four hours. I oh, was drinking for drinking. four hours. I was only drunk a part of the time. Um, and also, uh, I work on a little show with Mr. Vogel called Strawberry Shortcake Berry in the Big City. And guess what? Season three is coming in just a couple of months in July. Yeah, so, big announcements. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. yeah. Season three is coming in July, and then at the end of the year, you can get ready for four 44-minute CG strawberry specials coming nice. to a Netflix near you. Nice. I, I want to see the one with this guy. I want to see the one with this guy on it. That's that's the one I want to see. Is that, <laughs> is that, I want to see... I want to see that episode for God's sake. So wow, just, just putting, you know. putting the oh, Geek Buddies text chain out there for the world to see. That's not uh, that's not going to cause any problems down the road. It's fine. Uh, but anyway, yeah, we're going to have some fun uh, talking about this stuff. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just want to remind you all from the beginning here to subscribe to the channel. You know, I'm trying to make this more of an effort in all of my shows to remind you all three times during each show to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so. All kinds of stuff happening here. The Jedi way, obviously the Geek Buddies, the hot mic, my reviews and trailer reactions and all kinds of stuff that's happening the nation. So please subscribe down below so you can get notified when you click that bell as well of all the stuff that's happening. And of course, we've been, you know, kind of showing the Geek Buddies up in different days, different times. So you want to be aware of when to catch us, especially when we go live. So clicking down below to subscribe and hitting that bell button is the way to do that. Of course, hit a like on the video right now while you're at it and leave a comment. Um, all right, let's start off here first with some of the first reactions to Across the Spider-Verse. You know, this is coming out in just a few days already. Sony has started screening the film for critics for press. Um, and uh, the reactions have just been incredible to read and i'm going to bring him up uh here so you all can uh, follow along with me here this is off of variety but sean o'connell over there uh saying that spider-man across the spider-verse lives one step above a masterpiece it's an actual work of art every frame deserves to be hung in a museum it's outstanding brian david says it's yet another resounding win for the lord and miller produced universe Haley steinfeld really comes in rona's win stacy and her scenes with shea wiggum's captain stacy are truly special it's darker and sadder than i expected uh, my lady tessa smith over there mama's geeky saying it raised the bar with its unique animation style and way of storytelling minds are blown 
when it was released and fans thought there was no way it could be top. That's the original one. Well, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse raises its own bar, which seemed impossible with shocking twist, unexpected surprises, and a story that truly makes sense for the crazy multiverse world that we have all jumped headfirst into nowadays. Uh, uh, Mike Ryan here is saying it's not surprisingly terrific. It's it's he, he corrected this later with a follow up tweet with the punctuation. He's saying is not surprisingly terrific. It's a bigger story spread out over this movie and next. But it's still about Miles just wanting to be accepted for who he is. Um, and let's say Drew Taylor saying it's a stunning achievement. Visually da dazzling, expressive new realms in this as well. And Andrew Salazar saying it is yet another milestone for animation. It's gorgeous and visually mind blowing and surpasses the first film. But yeah, oh, but but also puts Miles and his family front and center. So, uh, gentlemen, your thoughts on these reactions here uh, from uh, these first uh, critics who've been able to see the movie and speak glowingly about it? I haven't seen now. I don't think I've seen one bad review on it online. M Mr. McClung. Yeah, well, a couple of things. So, one piggybacking on that first movie, how unexpected it was like people mm. just didn't really know like what it, what is this animated spider-man movie that they're going to be focusing mile that where they're going to be focusing on miles morales yeah and then you see what they did i mean the, the characters that they pulled in spider-man noir spider pig you know everyone from the from the uh, uh other universes yeah. it on paper you could i could see a world where this this looks like an unholy mess and it comes together so beautifully and knowing that, as you said, John, there haven't there hasn't really been a negative review. Everyone is speaking yeah. very, very highly of it. Incredible. And knowing that they developed this one and the next one that's coming out next year beyond the Spider-Verse at the same time. Now, I think in the past when you have a big movie that comes out and they're like, you know what? We're going to do two and three back to back. Yeah. It doesn't always work out like like I like Back to the Future Part Two, but I know some people are like it's not their favorite of the trilogy. Right. I think Back to the Future Part Three is wonderful as well. Again, people are like ah, you kind of lost you kind of lost the thread of uh, of Marty McFly, but and then thinking of like Pirates Two and Three as well. Like mm -hmm. you know we had this incredible Curse of the Black Pearl, and they're like we're doing two and three back to back, and there was just so much in those movies that you could see like ah, if you'd taken a little bit more time to develop this, maybe it would have turned out better. The fact that they developed two and three at the same time and number two is getting these just overwhelmingly positive reviews. Um, not only does it have me excited to go see the movie, but I'm really excited for the third chapter, like knowing that they nailed number two based off of uh, based off of how number one did. It's like you probably nailed number three, too. So it, it's yeah. very, very encouraging. Yeah, Michael, we just recently had a first installment of a trilogy and a lot of people were complaining about how uh, that film didn't 100 percent kind of left you holding the bag for what's coming, didn't do a lot with character development, really dropped the ball in how they were presenting some of these storylines and character beats. But it sounds like with this, even though it's part one of a part two, uh, of a two part story, it's a self-contained um, uh, film that is damn good, yet also prepares you for what's coming in uh, part two, and certainly it feels like uh, Infinity War into Endgame, saying that it, end, it has more darkness to it and sadness to it than you expect. You imagine it's going to end a lot happier at the end of part two. So what do you think about these reviews for uh, part one of uh, Across the Spider-Verse? Not surprising, but very satisfying. Mm. Uh, and, like, you know, because, sh look, Shannon's right. There's a lot of rules. What well, We all go to movies. Yeah. There used to be this rule, don't put two supervillains in a movie. It's too much. <laughs> the movie's going to be bad. Well, we have blown past that rule, and yeah. uh, there are many people that put everyone in the kitchen sink in a movie now, and it works great. Yeah. Shannon is right. A lot of times in the past, when you make two and three back to back, it hasn't worked well. The difference here is Lord and Miller. Mm -hmm. uh, well, look, if you point. go on HBO Max, I'm sorry. If you go on Max right now, uh, <laughs> you can watch season two of Clone High. Mm. A show that is getting a season two after what twenty years, and it's because of Lord and Miller. Uh, from the from the very beginnings of their career, everything that they have done, like this team knows how to tell a really really funny story, a really really heartfelt story, a really really crowd pleasing story, and that is like Lego Movie, Twenty One Jump Street, like all over the place where you go. So when the first Spider Verse movie came out uh, and blew everybody out of the water, it also wasn't surprising it was surprising how good it was like yes. yeah. as good and lord as good as, as lord and miller have been um spider-verse might be one of the best things they've ever done i uh i had yeah. a gentleman 
over here the other night and we ordered some pizza and we decided uh, to watch a movie and I decided uh, we put on the first Spider-Verse movie because I was like, oh, you know, I want to watch it again right before I go see the second one. And watching it again after having not seen it for a long time, you just realize how masterful it is. Like yeah. it, it's a, it's, it is by far, like by a mile, and I really like the Tom Holland movies, by a mile, it is the best Spider-Man movie that exists. Like there uh, is not yeah. a better Spider-Man movie than Spider-Verse. Like it is the best, yeah. most iconic Spider-Man movie that there is. Um, and not only that, it raised the bar in animation and changed the state of the animation industry. Yeah. Everyone else, you know, the, the new trailer for Disney's Wish, DreamWorks doing the bad guys. Yeah. Everyone is like, oh, we don't have to do things this way. We can do different animated styles. And so with this movie coming out, where we're going into these other universes that have entirely different animated styles, it's not yeah. just Spider, it's not just Spider Ham or Spider Noir in a universe looking different. It's Miles going into universes that look completely different. Yeah. And it sounds like they pulled it off. Shannon's right. It sounds like it could have been an unholy mess. But with right. Lord and Miller at the helm, it's Apparently, I mean, the word masterpiece is being used not by one or two people. Yeah, yeah. It's being used by, I've heard masterpiece. I've mm -hmm. heard Infinity War. Yeah. I've heard Empire Strikes Back. Whoa. So, I mean, my expectations going into this are really, really, really high. But based on the audience response so far, based on what yeah. we've heard from some of our friends who have seen the movie, and based on Lord and Miller's track record, I think with as high as my expectations are, they're going to be met and maybe exceeded. Yeah. Yeah, I think you make excellent points, both of you, for sure. And we should give love to the directors, Joaquin Dos Santos, Kim Powers, Justin K. Thompson, and the other writer on the on this as well, Dave Callahan. <clears throat> I mean, it takes a village, right? And it's, this is coming out five years after the last one. And certainly the bar was set because, as you said, both of you said, the first one is such a, was such a surprising hit. And, 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 no, it didn't make a billion dollars. Of course, animated um, superhero films rarely walk into that territory. I've never walked in that territory, I don't think. And but it won the Oscar for when a lot of people, including Amy Pascal, didn't initially think it had a shot to win Best Animated Oscar against the juggernauts of Disney or DreamWorks or even Illumination. And so there was questions about it. So the fact that it was able to ha almost have this groundswell of a campaign and got to that position and got that Oscar was pretty amazing. So how do you follow it up? You've got to go to the next level. So you take your time. You develop this thing. You really figure it out. You bring it an incredible cast like Brian Tyree, Henry back again, Luna Lauren Velez back again. But you add to the cast here with Daniel Kaluuya and Jason Schwartzman and other uh, actors here being involved in this and Issa Rae. So you throw even more diversity into the mix and make it seamlessly work. You introduce all these new Spider-Men, Spider-People rather, and all these different versions of Spider-Men and Spider-People that have existed throughout the comics. And it sounds like they made it all work. And what's the yep. thing that we always worry, well, as Shannon mentioned, when you bring too much in, or as Michael said, the rules, it can get overwhelming. Well, it sounds like they figured it out how to do concise, correct writing for all of these characters to pop in, have their moments, and pop on out, and you get more out of it. And, of course, Oscar Isaac Spider-Man 2099 is the one that I personally am 100% looking forward to seeing how they bring that to life here in the movie. So great to see all these reactions. Great, to see. And this doesn't feel like sometimes with certain superhero movies where they, they you know, the studio curates certain critics – that are always going to kiss the ass of the studio or that particular brand and gives them first shot at seeing this. This feels very natural and yeah. honest from a lot of these critics and a variety I, of critics as well. Yeah. I do think you make a good point for any geeks out there who want to do a little uh, a little track record and early uh, viewing of things. Like the entire creative team on this movie is amazing. And special yeah, yeah. shout out to Joaquim Dos Santos, who's one of my favorite animation mm. directors. Like super, sure. super nice guy, super awesome dude. But if you go back and look at like, uh, I think it's Double Date, Justice League Unlimited, uh, yeah. Black Canary, mm. Huntress, Question, and Green Arrow. Uh, Joaquin was directing on those and some of the best action sequences in those early wow. Bruce Timm uh, universe DC things yeah. were Joaquin's. Then he jumped over to a little show called Avatar The Last Airbender and some of the best bending action was him. And then he went to Voltron over at DreamWorks and Ooh. killed the action there. And now he's directing uh, a Spider-Verse movie. So yeah. in addition to me being pretty sure, thanks to Lord and Miller, that this is going to be an emotional, powerful, strong story, really funny, yeah. I think the action sequences in this movie are going to blow us out of the water. 
Yeah, uh, something to look forward to for sure. And, and the tracking on this is around $75 million, which I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, it sounds like from all the positive views as it builds, it's going to be a lot better. But uh, we should jump into our next topic, Mike. I think it's uh, track. Speaking of tracking, please, Speaking what do we got? That First of all, very well done. You should do this professionally. That was a hey. wonderful segue into our next topic, which is box office tracking. Um, so Hollywood Reporter had an article this week saying that uh, both The Flash and Pixar's Elemental yeah. uh, are not looking like they are tracking where the studios would like them to track. Uh, it looks like uh, The Flash is currently pacing to open in about the $70 million range, which is a little soft for a movie that has been yeah. so heavily promoted as being one of the greatest superhero movies of all time. Um, and at the same time, uh, Elemental is even softer for a Pixar movie. It looks like it's yeah. tracking to open around $40 million, which means that it would join, I believe, uh, Good Dinosaur and Onward being two of, being some of the few Pixar movies to open to less than $50 million. Yeah. So this is concerning for both Pixar and for Warner Brothers. Uh, you know, Warner Brothers uh, has had... Um, not a great time with superheroes with the back-to-back -back Black Adam and Shazam Fury of the Gods, neither one of them performing where they want to. And Pixar has been struggling mainly because throughout the pandemic, most Pixar movies, with the exception of Lightyear, uh, went straight to Disney+, Plus, didn't come out in theaters, and Lightyear just did not perform the way that Pixar wanted them to, so, wanted it to. So we've sort of lost that, ooh, it's a Pixar movie, I've gotta go see it, and right. DC is really struggling to find their footing, and so this news is not great. All that being said, I think box office tracking is kind of ridiculous because <laughs> yeah. what's that? It does, you know, it, it, this is one of those things that the studios do to be like, okay, well, we're going to try and use business and math and algorithms, and we're going to track things and figure it out. And at the end of the day, yeah, here's what's up. If these movies are good, they're going to do great. Elemental, I can't really say because, I mean, we've seen the trailers. We don't know. But based yeah. on everything we've heard about Flash – even if it opens in, in in the 60 to 70 million dollar range and we see a bunch of articles saying it was a really weak opening what's going on based on what we've heard that movie is going to have people going to see it over and over and over again because it's apparently amazing so yeah. it's going to be really interesting to track both of these movies and their tracking um so that we can have a discussion about box office tracking and how it's either ridiculous or uh maybe i'll be proven wrong what do you guys think yeah, I, I I spoke to a friend of mine who uh, went to Dream, uh, sorry, went to Pixar for the Elemental presentation, and this was just a few weeks ago. And he's a critic as well, and he reached out to me on DM because he saw my trailer reaction, and he said, "Trust me, what they're showing you in the trailer is not the full movie. There is much more going on here. People are going to be very, very surprised at how good this movie is." That trailer didn't 100% capture what this movie is really about. And I was like, wow, okay. And he said, yeah, trust me. We saw 25 minutes of the film, and it's incredible. So I wonder, yeah, like you said, I mean, this is really interesting. After the Lasseter stuff, it's been the reaction to Pixar has been a bit uneven in some of the – I've personally enjoyed – I don't think I've not enjoyed any of them that I've seen. Luca I liked. Uh, Onward I liked. The ones that are a little tr uh, troubling for some people. I enjoyed those. Soul was great. So – to me, I've enjoyed the Pixar installments that we've gotten for the most part. Um, and so I'm looking forward to this one now after hearing from my friend. So it may just be that maybe the marketing isn't that great. Or it may just be that people are pixar out and it feels like, you know, they don't feel like they want to go and see this thing. We'll see. Uh, the first reviews, I think, are going to really be the difference uh, for that. But the, the Flash one is really surprising. I mean, because it's what they're tracking right now is Black Adam numbers. And that shocks the hell out of me. If that's... If that really happens to this movie, then that's going to be a real problem for James Gunn. And I think, well, you know, they're holding out showing how can I, I'm not allowed to reveal how many minutes. Let's just say it's between five and 20 minutes that are missing from the cuts that everyone is seeing right now. The press has as only the people who've signed NDAs have been a, have been able to see the full movie from what I understand. And uh, I'm, I got my screening next week. So that's start, that's going to happen next week. So they're starting to open the door. You better not say a goddamn <laughs> thing when you right. get out of that movie. But the, they're opening the door to uh, showing more of the footage here. And that may be because they moved it up a week. I wasn't supposed to see it till uh, later. And they moved it up a week. I got the email yesterday from the publicist down here. And they said, I think they did that because they looked at the tracking. 
and are a little worried. And now they need the press to come out here and talk even more glowingly about it. But mm-hmm. for the most part, the Flash has gotten some po- very positive reviews online. I only seen a few bad ones, uh, but not that many. So uh, to me, I agree with you, Michael. I don't know if I buy this tracking necessarily. But this could be like, well, it's a new universe. Why do I need to go see it like it had with Shazam? Like it's totally going to have with Aquaman too. I don't know if that's I, well, I, It will happen out. with Aquaman for yeah, yeah. sure. For sure. Uh, yeah. I have some thoughts about it. Shannon, you haven't responded Ooh. yet. And I, I want to make sure that you're uh, engaged this morning as you, um, <laughs> as you sort of get your bearings. <laughs> <laughs> um, to, to the Flashpoint, like it. That it doesn't surprise <laughs> me. That it's ah. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me that that the that number is where it is because yeah. when you look at franchises right now, the the state of the DC, you know, DC on the big screen, it's not a beloved franchise. I mean, uh, you know, we th- there have been some movies that you know people have really connected to, like yeah. Wonder Woman, but for the most part, it is it, it it is in the throes of the law of diminishing returns now. Um, when you look at the movie going public as a whole, like, yeah. do they know who the flash is? Yes. Um, the flash was a, was one of the ensemble in justice league that also did not do a lot of business. Right. Um, the, the factor that I think people are curious about is Michael Keaton is Batman. Like that's the thing that people are, that, that people are curious about when you factor in the, the Zod, you know, the Zod storyline from man of steel, again, yeah. man of steel that came out in 2013, 13, I think. uh, so it, there is some distance between this, but because of folks that we've spoken to who have seen the movie of, of critical, critical response, mm-hmm. um, it's a movie that I think they want, would they love a huge opening? Of course, more importantly, they want it to have legs. Um, you know, when you look back when the greatest showman came out, that movie made $8 million opening weekend. It went on to make a lot more. It had these incredible legs because people just, it was just this joyous experience in a theater and people were going again and they were bringing people who hadn't seen it already. Yeah. So I, I think that's potentially what could happen with the flash hmm. um, with Jim- elemental. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, you're, you made a really good point, but I will give you props on your point after you talk elemental. Go ahead. So elemental. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's been a minute since Pixar has been big in the theaters. I mean, I, I think Lightyear is one third of a great movie. Um, oh, then, yeah. then the second and third act happen. I think the first act of Lightyear is absolutely stellar. Um, but everything else, you know, it, it was it was going to Disney Plus. I mean, onward. Um, but you know, that was that was a pandemic thing. I mean, would it would it have made more money if it had been in the theater? Yeah, it, it, potentially. Um, but it has been a minute since Pixar has been the thing since the days of you know Finding Nemo and The Incredibles, and, and like we have to go see the new Pixar movie. Ultimately, because it is a Pixar film, it's a family film. Yeah. If it's a good movie, people are going to come back to it. Um, the the brand, yeah. while not not what it what once was, uh, the brand is still very very valuable. And if it does connect with audiences, people are going to go see it. It's not the same. It's not the same thing as like a little movie coming out that might be fantastic and just not enough people see it. People are going to see these movies because they're big summer movies. Yeah. Um, the, the key will be is if they're good. Yeah. yeah, Shannon made a really good point, and I think it's worth this is this is why tracking annoys me. And I yeah. I, I didn't fi- I didn't figure it out until Shannon said it, which is yeah. Shannon's right. I I think if the way that you track and the way that you kind of pull people coming out of theaters and what are you interested in, general audience we know that the Flash is great. Yeah, Our, everyone who's listening to Geek Buddies knows it because we talk about it. We want we're on Twitter. We're hearing what people are saying. But people who are not huge superhero fans living in, you know, Iowa or Idaho or some other I state, um, you know, they they don't know. Indiana. So they're Illinois. Yeah. yeah. They, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, they don't know. And so they're like, yeah, maybe I'll see it. There's a lot of superhero movies. I'm a little confused. And Elemental is the same thing. Like, oh, maybe there's a lot of cartoons out. So tracking bothers me because tracking reinforces this idea uh that well let's make sure that everybody's very excited about something and it sort of robs you of doing stuff that's different um you know we were talking about spider-verse a few minutes ago well tracking on the first spider-verse movie where here's an animated spider-verse yeah. Here's an animated Spider-Man movie, but it's not Peter Parker. It's this guy, Miles Morales, that a lot of you don't know. And there's a lot of different people in it. And it looks different for a cartoon. Probably wouldn't have tracked great. 
probably didn't track great and probably got uh, the studio worried. And so I think when you do this tracking, it's sort of like, oh, well, maybe we made a mistake or people are confused. But Shannon's right with The Greatest Showman example. Like if a movie is good, everybody comes out of that movie and texts their friends and talks to their parents and emails their family and says, oh my gosh, you got to go see this movie. Yeah. And so I think Flash is almost guaranteed to do that. Um, Elemental, we'll see. But I think that that's, that's really the key is tracking is a guess. And it's a guess based on what we know, not what we don't know. And the biggest surprises in storytelling are the things that we don't know. Yeah, yeah, fair point, yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, we're seeing a lot of positive reactions. Uh, Warner Brothers has screenings available for people to see all over the country. I think you go to wbscreenings.com. You're not going to get those extra five to 20 minutes that are uh, missing uh, from it uh, until later on. And so you can at least have a good idea of what the film is. So I think they're doing that as a, as a response to um, how Shazam came out and how people reacted to Shazam as a dead fish in the water. So I think they feel this way. Uh, DC does and Warner brothers does. Uh, and certainly I'm sure Gunn has an issue as a part of this as well to like, Hey, let's drum up the ground grassroots interest in this movie by getting people to come see free screenings of the movie and they can come and talk about it and tweet about it. And that'll build the groundswell of support Although, for this movie. And then the critics will come out with their full reviews and we'll go from there. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Mike. Well, just really quickly. I mean, DC yeah. is actually in, I mean, oddly in this case, DC is in a great position with the flash. Mm -hmm. because so? It doesn't matter. Uh, oh, okay. if, if the flash does great, which I'm actually assuming it's going to be right. Uh, they're going to be like, look, People are excited about DC again. This Flashpoint thing created this new universe. Gunn is going to take this and run with it. And people are finally excited about DC for the first time. And we are going to ride this wave. And it's awesome. Yeah. If the Flash bombs, which I don't think it's going to do, but let's just say that it does, you say, you know what? Previous regime made that movie. That's why we're shifting gears. James Gunn has a whole new vision coming out. Like the, the, no matter what, yeah. where they're at this point where these it, Flash, Aquaman, and Blue Beetle, yeah. If they do amazing and get you excited about the DC universe, James Gunn and company will embrace them and say, yes, this is what we're giving you. And if they're bad, they're going to say, we know that's why we're doing something different. And so e it's a win-win for them either way. I, I, I have to disagree with you a little bit because Zaslav has been very adamant that he was not going to cancel this movie, that it was a great movie, one of the greatest superhero movies, if not the greatest superhero ever made. He's staking a lot of the PR reputation. And I know it doesn't give a shit, as you saw at the commencement speech of Boston. <laughs> I know he's a fucking supervillain, but like the the idea, like a legitimate supervillain, but like the idea that it's not gonna look bad if the flash I don't actually I think if the flash underperforms or God forbid bombs, I think that's gonna be egg, a big, big amount of egg on Zaslov's face because he could have killed this. Look, he killed Batgirl. He's killed all these shows. He's promoted James Gunn and Peter Safran to these positions. And he defended Ezra Miller against all their accusations by keeping them in the movie and saying, no, we're not going to shut it down. We're going to release this thing. Changed who is who is going to be the cameos. Changed the storylines. And now this extra footage is apparently connected to the James Gunn universe. So, which I don't know. I, like, I, I didn't see it. So, but I'm hearing from people that it is. And so I'm, I'm sure that's what it is. Yeah. And, and so the, this idea, so I think this will look really bad on them. If the film bombs, I think Aquaman too, they don't give a shit about, I, but I think the flash, because I think home is going to be Lobo, but I think the flash is absolutely one. They want to say like, we saved this. We made a lot of money off this. This is the, this is what you can expect going forward. Uh, because Muschietti is a fantastic fucking director. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, so we wonder, shall see. Yeah, yeah, we shall see when these movies come out and we will revisit this tracking discussion we, we will, will track sure. we will track the tracking yeah june's gonna be very busy for the geek buddies for sure for sure yes um all right let's take a quick break and we'll jump into our final uh, uh topic in the first half of the show uh right after this do 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 do
We should just release a, a, a Geek Buddies album, and all it is <laughs> is just like fifty nine tracks of Shannon's. Just like it's all just yeah. do 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 do. Shannon humming the- copyrighted material. I don't think we're gonna get away. With that. I don't think we're gonna get away with that. But maybe, maybe the uh, least downloaded and most legally <laughs> legally damning thing that you can get on Apple Music. Because exactly. no <laughs> we're talking about trailers, trailers, trailers. It's, it's, it's the trailers. <laughs> Trailers, yes. <laughs> so the first one, <laughs> the first thing, you know, since it, it seems appropriate, uh, we were just talking about the Flash. Let's talk about that final trash, uh, Flash trailer. <laughs> that was not trash. Whoa. Oh, Whoa. boy. <laughs> Zazz- Zazzle going to take me out with a sniper. Um, <laughs> rather unexpectedly, they released a third trailer. And at this yeah. point, I kind of feel like you didn't need to. Um, like the, the people that are excited about this movie, they are excited about this movie. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like, you know, we got to see a little bit more, a little bit more of Sasha Kai's Supergirl. We got to see a little bit more of, uh, alternate universe, Barry Allen and his family. Um, but again, like I, to me, there, there are just so many fantastic visuals in this, just in terms of like, just the, 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 the aesthetic action that they're putting out there. I, it's like I don't want to see anymore. I'm like, no, please don't, yeah. don't see any. Like, I, I want to, I want to watch that. I want to see this on a big screen uh, in a theater filled with people. Hopefully, filled with people. We'll see. <laughs> um, but, gentlemen, I'll throw it over to you. What did you think of our third look, our final look before we get to see it in the theaters of the Flash? Well, it, a lot of it was uh, stuff we got in the international trailer yep. a few weeks ago, so it wasn't all of it wasn't new. But there were some new stuff. Certainly, more action sequences. With Michael Keaton's Batman, uh, the stuff on the cars and the highway, a little bit more with Ben Affleck uh, and the soulful look that he gives Barry when Barry's like, I could save your parents, too. Like, I thought that's a really cool scene to throw in the trailer. The opening of the trailer is where the controversy lies, right? Because I think this is WB and marketing being like, hey, look, these girls like Ezra Miller and uh, see, it's cool. And uh, I think they were trying to fuck with the audience in a way by trying to maybe see him, see them. As like, it's okay, the stuff they've done. Look, he's flat. They're flash. So, you know, I, I I get the, I mean, I like it, but I get why they did it. But the trailer worked for me. It really did. It got me excited. Love seeing more. Listen, I'll tell you this. Uh, the more I see of Sasha Kaye, the more I want her as Supergirl to continue in the DC. I mean, just there's a power and a resonance and a strength to what she does with just these seconds of clips from this movie that I have a feeling I'm going to come out of this movie being like, there wasn't enough Sasha Kaye. She was so good. Now I got to be honest. I think Ezra Miller is damn charming as Barry Allen. It drives me nuts. I know the stuff he's done. I totally respect that, but I'm looking at it objectively as an or subjectively as an analyst here. He is really charming as the flash. You can't deny that, but getting, I think getting more of Keaton, more of his alternate flat or their alternate flash, getting more of uh of Ben Affleck was all nice to see in the action sequences, a little more of Zod. So for me, although we didn't need it, and I agree with you, Shannon, because obviously I'm already going to see it, it was nice to see just a little bit more. And I do think this was also done because maybe their internal numbers are telling them it's not getting as much hype as you think outside the bubble of people who like superhero movies, as Mike was alluding to. So, yeah. What do you think? Uh, Yeah, I mean, a lot of it was stuff that we've seen in the international trailer. I think, look, as far as the Ezra Miller thing, like, I think that was a funny moment in the international trailer. I think it's a funny moment in this trailer. Yeah. At a certain point, you just got to go into this movie. And like, if you do not like Ezra Miller and you don't want to support them, don't support them. Yeah. I 100%, of course. I, I 100% support you and you're not supporting Ezra Miller. <laughs> if you're excited about The Flash and you want to go see it, you just got to put who Ezra Miller is outside of it aside from it. Like, like there's, yeah. you just got to make that call. And so getting like Barry Allen is a character in this movie and they need to establish what the world thinks of Barry Allen in this movie. Yeah. And you, you know, at a certain point we can't all sit outside of it and be like, well, this is what they really meant. You're like, this is a flash movie. This is who the flash is. So I think, you know, you sort of got to just like either be, be, be in or not be in and either choice is fine. Um, but I do think the other thing that I'm oddly excited about in this movie, uh, given (laughs) if you, if you've listened to geek buddies ever, (laughs) um, Batfleck, not my thing. Not a big bat, not a big Batfleck fan. Right. Never right. have been. Never thought he was good. In the Hollywood Reporter uh, interview, when Air came out, 
that we covered a few months ago. Yeah. Um, he said he didn't feel like he really got Batman right until this movie and he's in it for about two minutes. And I got to say in this trailer, I was like, I think this might be where I finally like Batfleck. Like, I think that this is it. I think this is where I get on board. And it really was that moment. You know, out of everything in the trailer, I'm with Shannon. I'm with Shannon. I don't want to see any more action. I don't want to see any more visuals. You have sold me that this movie is going to be gorgeous. You have sold me on the concept. Now just surprise me. But the moment that Barry said, I could save my parent, I could save my, my, my mom. You, we could, I, you know, I could save your parents and seeing his reaction and realizing that at the heart of this movie are three characters that lost their parents, right? Barry's dad is in jail, uh, for the murder of his mom who is dead. Bruce's parents. If you've seen any Batman story ever in history, <laughs> you know, got shot. And, if you've ever um, seen pearls hit, hit some wet ground, you know what just happened. <laughs> um, and then um, Sasha Kaye's Supergirl, uh, her parents uh, yeah, died, planet. you know, yeah, because yeah. it's Kryptonians. It's a thing. So, mm-hmm. you know, you have these three characters that are dealing with this loss all coming together. Um, and so that one little bit in all of the awesomeness of the visuals and Batman and Supergirl and Zod and everything made me go, oh, yeah, they've got the heart of this movie figured out. And that's what got me most excited. You could argue five people, right? Because the other, the other Batman... And oh yeah, the other Flash, and possibly well, the other Flash, who, who I'm still, I'm looking <laughs> looking at those yellow headphones, and I'm like, I don't, I don't trust you. But um, uh, and Zod, I'm sure, has lost his parents at some point. Probably killed them himself. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of parents <laughs> that are being lost in this movie. They are- didn't kneel. They didn't kneel. They had to go. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Spike right through. My, by the way, Mike finds new interesting ways to insult the Snyder fans, saying that this is, this is the best version of Baffleck, and it's not even under Zack Snyder. I swear to God, Michael. All right. Shannon, I mean, he's actually quoting Ben Aff- Ben Affleck's the one that said it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just taking. I'm just taking what my boy Ben said. Your boy. <laughs> and just saying, hey guys, this is this is just what Ben feels about it. I'm I, I'm. I'm agnostic. I got no more opinions about <laughs> Zack Snyder's Snyderverse. <laughs> and the comment section is lighting oh, up. Yeah, it's well, fun. <laughs> the Flash is coming out in three weeks. Oh, uh, three more weeks, Crazy. and then you know we'll all be able to uh, we'll all be able to chat about it and find out if uh, if the, this is the home run that uh, WB thinks it is. Uh, that's definitely our... going to be that's definitely going to be a live spoiler review. Oh yeah, hundred Th- percent. Yeah. Uh, keeping with Warner Brothers, all three of all three of our theatrical trailers this week are from Warner Brothers. We got the first trailer for the uh, musical version of The Color Purple. So you know, The Color Purple came. You know, Steven Spielberg directed the original version back in 1985, starring Oprah Winfrey and Danny Glover. Uh, and then it was in 2005, I think they did. It, they put it on Broadway. I mean, as yes, 2004, yeah, yeah, 2004. Uh, they they put it on Broadway as a musical. Mm-hmm. And when you look at some of the folks that were involved in that Broadway production. One of them is uh, Renee Elise uh, Goldsberry, who, you know, went on to be in Hamilton and then in She-Hulk. Um, but yeah, this, this, I, I've not heard the music from this. I had, I was not in New York at that time, so I didn't get to, I didn't get to see the show, but the music thus far, the visuals, like this looks like a really, this looks like a really, really uh, in, incredible movie. You know, you have uh, Halle Bailey from, who is playing the Renee Elise Goldsberry role, the Nettie role. Um, uh, fresh off the Little Mermaid, um, we have Coleman Domingo from Fear the Walking Dead in the Danny Glover role, um, and we have Taraji P Henson as well. Uh, I just thought visually, this just this looked this looks like a great. It's coming out on Christmas Day. This looks like a great Christmas movie. Like you know, you think about the the musicals that have come out in the past, the really good ones. It's always around. It's always around the time uh, time of the holidays. So I'll throw it over to you, gentlemen. What did we think of our first look at the color purple? Yeah, I'm a big. Um, I love the Steven Spielberg version. I love it, and of course, Alice Walker's novel is fantastic too. But like Steven Spielberg's version, I mean, for a white director directing a black story, this was a for a teenager, young teenager like me, this was an intro into the black experience, right? As a movie that kind of showed me that as a young teenager. So I've always held that film in esteem, uh, uh, and as an example that it can be done. It's not usually the way to go, but it can be done. So you look at this movie where it's all black filmmakers black creators people it was very much about that a musical adaptation of it's really interesting as well and you look at it and i don't know the director that well so this is my first experience to what they can do 
with the work, but seeing all these wonderful actors and certainly, I mean, Taraji's just like, a, a, to me is like one of those diamonds, man, diamond actress. You can see her in anything. She's great. She brings, she was just in Abbott elementary as, uh, uh, as Quinta's mom. And it was great. She was great in that role. So like, to me, she's one of these actresses is going to bring the right weight to a character like Suge Avery, which is fantastic mm -hmm. in the original Spielberg version. So to see that this is going to have a very much people who understand the culture deeply on a primal level, on an instinctual level, and bringing that out, these little nuances, these little extra um, stuff that's going to be here for us to enjoy. It's going to be like revisiting this all over again and be getting a more enriching experience, even though the first one was already good. So add in the music, which I hear is fantastic. It was nominated for like 11 Tonys. And then it was a revival. I think in 2016, 2017 got four other nominations for Tony. So it's a, it's got a lot of pedigree, this story. And it looks like we're going to get a fantastic film and certainly Christmas day. Cause this is a family story uh, found or otherwise is, is the perfect time to kind of drop this film. So yeah, Mike, what'd you think? Man, I this is going to hurt me to say. Mm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it's really painful. But at this point, Steve Spielberg's Color Purple is a very old movie. Yes. <laughs> so, just makes me... Fuck you! <laughs> I mean, it is. It's, uh, I, don't, I don't like... To me, it's like, oh yeah, it came out a few years ago. I'm like, no, it came out a long time ago. Uh, but I, I'm with John. I, uh, you know, as a huge Spielberg fan, Color Purple is close to the top of my list of Spielberg yeah. movies. And so, if you are listening to this right now... Uh, and you saw the trailer for the new color purple and you've never seen the original with Oprah Winfrey, Danny Glover, Whoopi Goldberg, like do yourself a favor and go watch that movie because I, I am, I am hundred percent with John. It is a, it is a masterful movie. It is a gorgeous movie. It is a beautiful movie. Um, you know, made Whoopi Goldberg's career. Yeah, it was a uh, debut performance. Yeah, yeah. And as much as I love that movie, when this trailer, when I watched this trailer, I was like, I am on board. Like this is a, it 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 has all the elements um, that I loved. It, just based on the trailer, it has all the elements that I loved about the Spielberg movie, but looks like it's a much deeper, uh, more, um, I don't want to say authentic, but kind of like more a deeper, more authentic, more yeah. like gr just really, really getting in there. And then, and it's a musical, so uh, I'm gay. It's like it's like uh, my bread and butter. I'm going. Like, come on, come on, guys. So I am. Uh, yeah, I'm super, super excited. Um, yeah, and I was very. I'm with Shannon. Like, it's a like Christmas day. I know what I'm doing. Like, it will be. Yeah. Hey guys, we're gonna open presents. We're gonna have some breakfast. We're gonna hang out for a little bit, and then we're all going to see Color Purple. <laughs> it's like theater camp, right? There are. Straight plays and musicals. <laughs> there are straight plays. There are straight plays and musicals. So is a musical a gay play? Yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> well, the color purple comes out again on Christmas Day, and that brings us to our third Warner Brothers Warner Brothers film. This is the third trailer for Barbie. Uh, so that first teaser, you know, that was that was just a teaser. That was, and it was very very funny. Megan, you know, is in the vein of two thousand one, seeing all these little girls with dolls. Um, the second trailer, we got our first look at uh, the world of Barbie, and just bright, vibrant. Um, and really, really funny. I mean, you, you get some, some fantastic performances out of all of your various Barbies, all your various Kins. And now with this trailer, we get to see what Barbie and Ken look like in the real world. And the comedy is just, it is just uh, uh, spiking for me. We get, we get uh, our first look at Will Ferrell, who is, uh, it seems to be our villain. Um, it, this just looks so, so funny. You know, uh, when they were shooting... Uh, the scene of the uh, Barbie and Ken uh, rollerblading in Venice. Um, you know, those pictures went up very, very quickly because you see them in these very you know, bright neon outfits. And seeing that the actual scene that they filmed is going to be just as funny as the visual when those pictures first came out. <laughs> very, very encouraging. <laughs> Gentlemen, what did you think of, I'm assuming, our last look at Barbie before she comes out? What do we think? Mike? Man, who knew? that Barbie was going to be one of the most hotly anticipated movies of the summer. <laughs> right. <laughs> did not, did not in a summer of superheroes and like epic tentpole movies, like did not have this on my bingo card. And I got it. And, and, and like much like when the Lego movie came out and you saw yeah. these trailers, you didn't realize how good that movie was going to be but lego movie kind of set the bar for if you're gonna when you hear that like some toy company is making the movie version of you're like well 
it, Lego Movie shouldn't have been what it was, and it was this. And it, you can just tell from this trailer that they, I think, have knocked this out of the park. Mm. Like, and, and they know it. Like to have a movie, <laughs> to have a movie trailer that says, "If you love Barbie, this movie is for you. <laughs> if you hate Barbie." This movie is for you. I mean, that's the whole audience right there, guys. That's everybody. You covered. You covered all your bases. Um, but yeah, it just it just looks like they really know what they're doing, and and there have been so many different versions. I mean, Bar Mattel has been trying to develop a Barbie movie forever yeah. and ever and ever, and it's like, well, is this? You, it, it can't really be a movie in Barbie's world. Like, what is that? And but like, if Barbie's in the real world, and is this a movie about? Well, Barbie's body should be this, and it's about body expectations, and it, like they have gone through every different person permutation with every creative in the industry of like, well, what should a Barbie movie be? And to land on, no, let's let Barbie be Barbie and let's take that through its logical conclusion yeah. uh, seems to be the direction they went. And I think, I think it's great. Yes. I'm with Michael. I, I no way when they announced this that I think I was going to want to see this movie. And look, I love Greta Gerwig as a director, I, as an actress, but as a director, I really enjoy her. Like, you know, I thought Lady Bird was good. I thought, Little Women was really good. So yeah. um, I was curious to see what you were going to get. And, you know, you throw in Margot Robbie. And look, Margot hasn't really had a lot of hits lately, but certainly people respect her work, respect her as a producer. So, okay, what are you going to bring to it? And it finally, we got a trailer that gave us a little bit more of the story, a little bit what this is going to be about. You know, you've got essentially Will Ferrell reprising Lord Business from the Lego movie. So he's going to have his issues there. And, and, you know, but it's it, it, what I think is going to be real interesting to see. And, and one of the lines in the, in the trailer kind of made me think this is it's going to walk that line between being a two hour commercial for Barbie and also saying something about the current state of our world. And I already saw some uh, neck beards getting upset about the fact that all the men in the trailer are stupid or sexist or dumb or whatever. And it's, it's going to be part of that. And you, so you're going to have to navigate that nonsense as you see this. But I think there's going to be a very strong and interesting message by the end of the movie that's going to shock a lot of people because Greta's really good at this subversive stuff within the work that she does. You know, Lady Bird's got that. Uh, Little Women's got that. So I, I won't be surprised to see it come here. That being said, the vibrancy of the trailer, I mean, getting, um, oh, oh God, what's her name from SNL? Kate McKinnon. Get a Kate McKinnon, Kate McKinnon. To, come in to be the the Nia or the uh, Morpheus for that world. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was genius, man. So to me, you got to use Kate McKinnon the right way. That's the right way to use Kate McKinnon and having this incredible cast. So I'm going to be real curious what the end result's going to be when I watch it. But I'm very excited again after this trailer. And I love that Damon shot down the idea of Oppenheimer versus Barbie going, you know what? You could see two movies in a weekend. It's not going to kill you. So I like that we're going to get that as kind of counter to Oppenheimer as well. So maybe, maybe do Oppenheimer and then to wash it all out, the sadness and all that, go to Barbie. And it'll make yeah, it I feel like there's only movie. one direction you do that double feature. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't do it the other way. <laughs> Unless you're a depressive, I guess. Yeah, like, yeah. like, oh, Barbie was great. Really made me feel great about the world. Boo. <laughs> like, you just, yeah, don't do it that way. Come on. I don't want to feel hope. Get out of here. Give me Oppenheimer. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so yes, <laughs> July 21st, the most interesting double feature in the history of cinema, Oppenheimer <laughs> followed by Barbie, <laughs> which again will be July 21st. So to our fourth trailer, which I will have very little to say other than to say that <laughs> this trailer happened. Um, we, there was a trailer for uh, the second season of Star Trek Strange New World. Yeah. I tried to watch the first episode. I, I, I think there was a lot that I was, a lot of context that I did not have. Uh, so I'll just throw it over to you, gentlemen. Hey, what do you think about the uh, trailer for the second season of that show? I don't watch. <laughs> Mikey, what do you think of this trailer, man? I will. I will never. Shannon can watch. If there is a superhero thing, he will watch it. And even if he didn't know the context of a thing, he'll Google it. He'll look it up. He'll watch five minutes of a Star Trek and go, well, I'm out. I don't know. <laughs> That's too much. What's a warp? What's a warp coil? Yep. I don't know. I got to go do something. I got to go work at Universal. Um, I, the, the, the first trailer, I, I do think it's a little bit of like what we were saying with, um, flash, like the first trailer for season two of strange new worlds was great. Didn't yeah. really need a second trailer, but glad I got it. And I am super on board. I think aside from Picard season three, which will now for all times be one of the greatest seasons of television in the history of all television for me, yeah, yeah. um, strange new world season one just kind of brought a freshness 
to Star Trek that mm. even though I really love Discovery, I love, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Trekkie. I will watch all the Star Treks. I, I think Lower Decks is really funny, but mm. Strange New Worlds really brought this freshness uh, and lightness to the franchise that hadn't been there in a while. Yeah. And it looks like they're both doubling down on that, but still expanding the bigger story that they are aiming to tell. And I love how bright and shiny it is. I like how sparkly it is. I really like enjoy this cast. Like this is one of the TV shows that I'm most excited about coming out uh, in the next several months. Yeah. Yeah. I loved it. I thought it was great. Cause like, uh, this is one I discovered while I had COVID. Like I finally was down for the count. I had to watch something and I don't usually like to watch things when I'm sick. I'm kind of in a different place than other people are. Cause I, I'm so viscerally involved with stuff. You guys have watched movies with me. It's exhausting sometimes to get in, to watch. Something it's exhausting like. to watch you. <laughs> you know what? Don't say that while I'm on the show. You son of a, anyway. Yeah. So this, <laughs> this whole thing. So it doesn't, so, but getting into strange new worlds, it was so fun. You know how Picard season three was like crack for the lack of a better term. For next generation lovers, Strange New Worlds was that for the original series lovers. It was so yeah. evo evocative of the original series with the tongue firmly planted in its cheek, but with stakes there, with new interesting villains, with fun stories, a great fucking crew with different variety in terms of the characters and the actors and the diversity across the board. So I was I was really blown away by Strange New Worlds. And in fact, when I saw this trailer I was like, I'm just going to do a whole rewatch re uh, soon and on a Saturday, just go back to back to back and have a fun getting back into that world and getting to know these characters all over again in anticipation for season well, two coming out. This trailer had some fun stuff. Michael mentions Lower Decks, seeing those two characters from Low Lower Decks coming in. And apparently that's going to be a singular episode that is combining animation with live action. And it's going to be directed by Jonathan Frakes. So I love that they're taking that kind of chance this is something Star Trek, the original series would do. So I well, love that they're taking that kind of chance with I, the season two. So yeah, I love the trailer. Shannon's, love yeah. Shannon's comments notwithstanding, I would say uh, <laughs> the thing about Strange New Worlds that's great is that, you know, Star Trek in the past few years has kind of tried to, like in TV, they've told these bigger arced stories. So Discovery yeah. is all about... Yeah, it's an arc story over the season. There's big reveals, whatever. What Strange New Worlds did that was really fun is they kind of went back to that original Star Trek formula, yeah. which yeah. is it really, even though there's a couple threads, character threads and stuff that go throughout the season, they are doing that show that each week is its own new sci-fi story. Yeah. So they can do the thing where everybody, everybody on the ship is all of the sudden in medieval magical clothes for an episode right. and you don't really know why. Right. Or they can do the episode where you go on a planet and here's the social commentary that we're going to deal with this week and then you're off on another adventure. And so Strange New Worlds out of all the Star Trek shows is the one that's the most accessible mm -hmm. to you don't need to know a ton about Star Trek to enjoy the characters in the show. And so I'm, I'm really excited for more of that as well. They combine the adventure of the week with still overarching storylines for all the characters through the whole season. Like uh, the doctor with, her, with his daughter who was yeah. stuck in suspended anyway. So you, you do get those overarching storylines, but as Michael said so well, you, but you get enjoying the feeling of uh, uh, the adventure of the week, which works so well. Yeah. Jan, Jan, anything well, else? Star, uh, Star Trek, strange new worlds is a show mm -hmm. and it's second season <laughs> is starting on June 15th on Paramount plus. That's so soon. Mikey, are we going to review that thing? Are we going to open the door to the possibility? I mean, we can open the door to the possibility and discuss it after the show, John. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, all right. Well, let's take a quick break, and then we're going to jump in to talk about the state of Marvel right now, considering all the news that came out this week and the last few days, as well, last couple of weeks as well, and uh, talk about it here right after this. Do 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 that feels a little bit now when i hear that theme almost like melancholy like bittersweet like oh god remember when we were excited about this concept? there's a great uh it's the what? i think it's one of the final tracks in um infinity war oh yeah where it is the melancholy it's basically after they all got dusted and it's this really like <laughs> minor like it's dun, 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 dun. and i feel like right now where marvel's at that's the music that's playing in yeah the yeah we don't mean to bury the lead but yeah that's definitely how we're jumping in to talk about this conversation of the state of marvel uh just over the last couple of days uh news has come out that thunderbolts uh has stopped production uh because of the amptp versus wga situation that's going on with the dga and sag 
on deck next to uh, possibly strike DJ in negotiations now with AM with the studios or AMPTP, however you want to call it. And uh, SAG already sent out their uh, requests for strike or not strike to people. So that's we're going to hear results of that very soon as well. So there's a lot going around on this that's stopping production. Uh, on um, on uh, uh, the Thunderbolts, which was something Harrison Ford. I mean, it was great. People were looking forward to this as a next step. All these characters coming back, Florence Pugh. Um, and then they also announced that Wonder Man has essentially gone away as well. Uh, so is that going to come back? We don't. So there's a lot of questions here. And then you throw in Jonathan Majors, and the, the, I, the he's now apparently dating Megan Good, actress Megan Good now. It's so quickly he's moved on from that situation. Uh, uh, trying to create a PR, trying to w- kind of wash himself from the PR nastiness that was around everything going on with his previous girlfriend or previous person he was dating. So he's on the PR kick to redeem himself and all of that. And who knows how much of that is authentic or not, but Marvel and Disney are apparently waiting for the court case to come through to see what they're going to do. And what Jeff reported on the hot mic last week is that the writer of um, Multiverse of Madness, Jeff Loveness, is off Avengers Kang Dynasty, uh, 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 Secret Wars, rather. I think was he doing Secret Wars or Kang Dynasty? I think he was doing Kang Dynasty. Kang Dynasty. So he was off Kang Dynasty, um, and um, he gave no retort that that was not true. So that lets us believe that it is true that he's off of it. And now we're hearing what Jeff heard yesterday is that there's rumors in the wind about who is going to direct Secret Wars. And the name John Favreau has popped up to come back. Sam Raimi is apparently in consideration for this. Dustin Daniel Cretton has said he wants to continue from Kang Dynasty into Secret Wars, which seems logical. And Ryan Coogler is another name that they've thrown out. Also, Nia DaCosta has been in, was in er, an early possible rumor as well. So there's a lot of movement on all of this. But we've still got Secret Invasion coming. We've still got Loki Season 2 coming, depending on how the Jonathan Major stuff goes out. So, gentlemen, there's, there's controversy, cancellations, drama, uh, and all stuff going on here in Phase 5. And then we hear more from Elizabeth Olsen, who keeps coming out with these interviews, bashing Multiverse of Madness and the writing procedure around Multiverse of Madness. So, I mean, are we in a complete and utter decline? Even if Secret Invasion is good, are we in still in a deep, steep decline right now with uh, with Marvel? I, I wouldn't say we're in a steep decline. I mean, Guardians 3 is doing very sure. is doing very very well sure um yes. and if secret invasion is as good as folks are saying it is i mean that will be a good shot in the arm in terms of them you know suspending production on things that's not a huge shock i mean uh, sure. mo- most of hollywood has ceased to operate right, right now that's not to say that nothing is shooting like there are still some things shooting um but when you're working on a film or or a series that is one part of a giant interconnected universe Um, you're going to have to do rewrites. Like that's just something that's going to happen. So the fact that they have um, made the decision to pause rather than, you know what, let's just shoot what we have. And if stuff changes, let's do a bunch of costly reshoots, which granted reshoots are factored into their budgets. But, you know, we've seen, or rather we've read that um, the reshoots is part of the uh, uh, effects, was part of the effects brouhaha is that, you would do these um, elaborate sequences and suddenly like, nope, we're doing this instead. And how that is very detrimental. That has been very, very detrimental to the process as a whole. So the yeah. fact that they're pausing, I mean, it's a bummer. It's it's a bummer because more than likely, I, I would have, I, w- I think even pre-strike, we all kind of assumed that there was going to be some schedule shuffling yeah. in the wake of everything like the, the, the FX, the FX article um special effects article um now because of the strike and there doesn't seem to be an end in sight right now um granted you know we're not we're not in those negotiations so anything could happen um but it seems like the schedule shuffling is is definitely going to happen now so the fact that they're pausing not a big thing it's a bummer because i think you know we would all like to get we would like marvel to get back to you know Phase three, that that's right. you know that's that's what everybody wants. Um, in terms of Jonathan Majors, like I can't remember the article that I had read. Um, I really should have sent you all the link, but they were basically saying that the whole idea of Kang as the big bad for Phase four, five, mm-hmm. and six that that wasn't something that that was that was being considered until yeah. after 
his performance in uh, Loki and in Quantum Mania that they're like, wow, this this could really be this could be this could be the way this could be the guy. Yeah. Um, and now seeing that everything is kind of in tumult as a result of this situation, um, it's really interesting. I mean, I know a lot of folks uh, on the heels of Guardians three um, were like, you know what, the High Evolutionary. He 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 was a Kang variant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like he he's he's going to be Kang now. I mean, Marvel has recast in the past. Like that is yeah. not that's not a big deal. Uh, a role of this size, that would be the first time. But it'll be really interesting to see what they what they decide to do. I mean, and as fans, I think more than anything, like if they recast, they recast. What we want more than anything is just a, a good time in the theater. Yeah, and I, and I and I did mention Fantastic Four, which has also had a lot of drama around the casting. Who are they looking at? Who are they going to go with? Apparently, Emma Stone turned it down. Is Jodie Comer now in play? What's the who do they want to bring into this? Are they going to go Jewish? Are they not going to go Jewish? Are they going to go black? Like where? There's so many questions that are that are circling around that with drama around that as well, Michael. Uh, but a little bit of good news: the Spider-Man Two game, all that stuff was announced yesterday, and when it's coming out, there are great footage. Uh, friend of Yuri Lowenthal, friends of the show. He, he, uh, of course, is the voice of the main Spider-Man. There, he talking about it. So there is some positive stuff. Maybe not connected to the MCU, but for the brand of Marvel, some positive stuff to kind of offset all of this stuff in the MCU. What are your thoughts here on all of the stuff that's going down, Mike? You know, this is this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where you could pay the big bucks in Hollywood mm -hmm. because when everything's going great and you're getting all the credit, it's awesome. It feels wonderful. Yeah, you know, you're like everyone's like, oh, you're amazing. Marvel, Marvel, Marvel's reshaped cinema. Marvel's the biggest money making franchise in the history of Hollywood. Like they can't lose. It's awesome. It's great. And and look, and all credit to them because what they did with phases one, two, and three, like nobody's done before. Like it, the reason yeah, we true. all freaked out when Infinity War and Endgame came out is because Infinity War and Endgame should not have been as good as they were. Like they yeah. actually pulled off one of the biggest hat tricks in cinema. I mean, I, I know that a lot of the uh, auteurs would argue with me on that, but oh. in the history of cinema, like as, as important as so many cinematic achievements have been, making 20 odd movies over a decade, all interconnected and having a grand finale, no one's done that before. Yeah. It's huge. And one of the biggest things, everybody knows that when you're struggling, you have anxiety. Like everybody knows that when you're trying to get into Hollywood, when you're trying to make it big, there's a lot of fear and insecurity and anxiety. When you're at the top of the heap, there's a lot of fear and insecurity and anxiety because you got to hold on. And right now what you're seeing is Marvel spinning as they're not getting the response that they are used to getting. Yeah. Uh, and, and not just externally, not just all of us fans going, eh, phase four didn't really do it for me. I don't really know. I'm kind of uh, the, the box office isn't as good, but internally, like Victoria Alonso, gone. Yeah, right. Uh, Elizabeth yeah. Olsen kind of being more public than Marvel actors have been in the past with, well, this was frustrating. I basically was telling the same story twice with WandaVision and Multiverse of Madness. Would have preferred to not have to do that. So yeah. you're seeing even internally that there's a lot of like, oh, what are we doing? Where are we going? And I think it is Kevin Feige being spread very thin. I think it is the stress and pressure of we did this amazing thing and now let's do it again. Um, and I think there's the stress and pressure of like too much content, um, yeah. you know, between the TVs and the movies, like one, two, and three was just, here's a bunch of movies. Yeah. And once the Disney plus TV thing happened and you had more stuff going on, uh, you have to make sure it's all connected. And I think we can all agree that we've seen the fraying of the edges of those interconnections where we're sort of like, all right, well, Wakanda forever, you were good, but man, I really feel like you were stuffing stuff in there for your Disney plus shows. So like, we're all, we're all feeling that and they, and Marvel internally knows that and they're probably feeling it too. And everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. And then in the middle of all of this, you get a strike. Yeah. Um, and, and like Shannon said, you know, like the strike, it's not surprising. Marvel's not the only movie, uh, movie, movie studio that's putting a pause on things. Everyone in TV and movies yeah. is putting a pause on things. But when you are just doing a singular movie and you put a pause on it and you come back to it later, it sucks, but that is what it is. When you have 15 projects 
where everyone has to interconnect and this character shows up here, but then they show up here in the next movie. But now because of scheduling things, this actor can't do this. And when the strike is over, this is going to get pushed back. Like for Marvel, it's just way more of a headache. Like one, yeah. once these things go on pause, when the strike is over, they're going to have to look at everybody's availability, everybody's schedules, and then go, oh, okay, well, we thought this was going to happen, but that was going to happen. And then this, and then you had the Jonathan Majors thing. Like, it's just like, it's just a piling on of stuff. So yeah. that is not great. Like they're not in a great spot. Like Guardians is doing really good. Secret Invasion is apparently amazing. Mm -hmm. But in addition to all of that, as big of a story as the Infinity Saga is, Secret Wars ends the universe. Yeah. The universe ends. <laughs> That's what happens in the comic book. So uh, pulling this off is yeah. just way more complicated. So if they can do it, it's great. But like, that's what we're seeing right now. And, and, and the, the, the it sounds like a lot. You kind of go, this is, this is a big pile of shit, but this is where the real talent comes in. This is where you have to like, take a deep breath, get out of bed, make a to-do list and just handle one. Th like this is the, they need to go watch Finding Nemo and just tattoo, just keep swimming on your head and just <laughs> handle it one step at a time. Like they can do it. You, They can pull this off. Yeah. Uh, they can get out, of, to your point, John, they can get out of this nosedive. They can get back on track, but you've got to make, you got to make some big choices creatively, mm. uh, you know, behind the scenes and you've got to stick with them and you just got to just put your head down and keep swimming. Yeah, it feels like COVID part two, where everything's being kind of uh, stalled or delayed and what's the production going to be like? And right, are, are these, like, depending on how this long this strike goes and if more of the uh, guilds get involved in the strike and this goes on for six months or, God forbid, a year, then you're going to have to rejigger so much about, and what Michael said so well, the availability of these actors. And, you know, as Emma Stone turned down Sue Storm, in my mind, it's a little bit like, oh, this looks like an, you know, an unstable situation. I don't know if I don't want to walk into it. It becomes more stable if you're canceling stuff, you're rearranging storylines, you're trying to deal with the, with the uh, um, uh, back or the press, the bad press over your main villain, the actor, your main villain being accused of these uh, uh, he said, she said assault allegations type thing. So th there's a lot of this. And yeah, surely Guardians of the Galaxy is doing well, but that's a filmmaker who's left you to go and take another thing. He's wrapping up stuff from previous phases. So yes, it's doing well, but it's not a harbinger of the good stuff that Marvel's going to do because that director's left. He left to go do his own thing. So yes, that's great, but there's this is going to be the new thing that they're moving into. And the new stuff, like Ant-Man and the Wasp, has not been received well. Thor Love and Thunder wasn't received well. Wakanda Forever, as Michael said, yes, overall received well, but a lot of criticisms about the stuffing in. Then some of these TV series that got stunted because of COVID, didn't do well. So uh, Jeff Snyder mentioned this on the hot mic as well a couple of weeks ago. Iger is, and Feige have come to the decision to bring in, bring back more experienced writers, pay the, those writers more money because the younger writers they were given opportunities to are clearly letting them down overall, not on everything, but certainly enough to dent the brand the way it feels right now. And so, as you said, Michael, these are where you make these tough decisions. You make these decisions and you, you move forward. Loveness being removed is certainly a symptom of that, that they felt these younger writers really weren't getting across what they needed to get across and get excitement from the overall fan base for people to come to these movies over and over again. And although Multiverse of Madness made a lot of money, it's like X-Men Last Stand. Surely it made the most of any X-Men movie, but nobody looks at it as like the greatest film ever made or the best film in the X-Men I mean, franchise. So It does have I'm Juggernaut, bitch, which... Yeah. <laughs> Right. I mean, that's fair. that's fair. Iconic, not good, but <laughs> iconic. Um, yeah. No, I mean, I think like what what you're seeing is, and this is this is you know we've seen it with DC, whatever. Like, yeah, it's not easy to tell hmm. a giant interconnected story, and and what Phase Four kind of did for better or for worse, is they were spreading everything out. Oh, we've got Shang-Chi over here. Yeah, the Eternals right. over here. Okay, we've got the the TVA in space okay well there's the quantum well they've been they've been expanding out and you're right john like guardians is kind of wrapping up a a story that was more yeah. infinity saga than multiverse it has it doesn't touch the multiverse right and dr strange 
And with the exception of No Way Home, Doctor Strange and Quantumania and the things that do kind of touch the multiverse, well, yeah. the exception of, I'll say Loki as well, but like, it's a little bit hit and miss. Like we know yeah. they're doing multiverse and we're intrigued, but it doesn't have that strong thing. The strongest movies that they've had, again, No Way Home aside, are like the standalones. Like Guardians yeah. is a standalone. Wakanda Forever is just, it, it introduces Namor, but it's not touching multiverse stuff. So they really need to get some experienced writers and directors in there to say, okay, here's here's everything on the board. Yeah. How do we get everyone excited and start funneling to this? And how do we make sure this story really delivers? Uh, and this is not something that you give to someone who you're like, yeah, you're the hot young writer. Let's give you a shot at ending the entire Marvel universe and hitting the reset button. Yeah. Shannon, what are your thoughts on all this? Well, you know, like I, I would be really curious. And, and again, these are, these are plans that have already been scuttled, but I would, mm -hmm. I would be really curious what uh, the original multiverse of madness was going to be. Um, because oh, Michael yeah, Waldron right. does take a lot, like he takes a lot of flack yeah. as the writer of that movie. Um, but also, as well as Sam Raimi. Um, but you know, they, he, he's talked about in interviews that is like, we, we had what we were doing and then that changed. And I believe Waldron is supposed to be writing secret wars. Mm. I might be wrong about that. Yeah. But I think it's, I think it's tough to base Waldron off of multiverse and madness because, of everything that happened during the production of that, like that, that it was it was going to be one thing, it turned into another. Um, so the whole thing with Loveness, because I think he was a Rick and Morty writer too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And by the way, um, if I said Multiverse of Madness, Loveness wrote Ant Man and Wasp: Quantum Mania. I want to make sure. Well, no, no, you, yeah, no, I'm saying Waldron wrote Multiverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Loveness if I, if wrote, I made that mistake, I apologize. No, you didn't. No, you, no, you were, you, you were correct. Okay. Um, but you know, again, and I don't know if looking at quantum mania you you look at the issues that that movie has i i don't think you can put it all on jeff loveness i mean there 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 were other problems that were there but again the folks above you know no no writer is making something unilaterally like there is a ser there Especially are folks that yeah. definitely there are folks that say yes yes or no so, you know, they have to share a little bit of that responsibility as well, because if they were unhappy with ultimately what was coming, you know, coming to pass, that they could have stopped it. Yeah. Now, you know, uh, uh, the direct original director of Doctor Strange, the first one, uh, Derek, oh, uh, Scott, uh, Derrickson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scott Derrickson, Scott um, Derrickson, you know, he, he did say he, he hit, removing himself from the sequel, saying, you know, you shouldn't base a movie off a release date. Mm -hmm. Um and so at some point, like maybe drafts were being turned in and it was sort of like, okay, we can either delay or we can, we can make this. Yeah. So I think as a whole, looking at things kind of like what star Wars is trying to do, like, let's, let's make sure we're happy with what we're making yeah. before we announce its release date. Um, and again, it's just such a challenge when you have, as Vogel said, like 15 projects in the works, yeah. that's a, that's a tall order. So it will be interesting to see, like, is is if Kevin Feige and his team are able to uh, right the ship. Well, I think that's why Iger comes in to slow things down. With I look, and I know it's a, it's horrible that he's laid off what seven thousand, eleven thousand workers at Disney. It's a tough, tough thing, tough pill to swallow for sure. Having been there, it's a tough pill to swallow. But you look at it overall as a company, they they had to do something. They were bleeding money. They were losing what they they were they, they were losing the PR wars all over the place with the VFX article with other stuff. I mean, currently, Elizabeth Olsen, to add on to what she's already said, her most recent interview, she was like, they were writing so many versions of the script. I just told them to give me the final pages on the day of the shoot because I didn't want to have any more input on what was going on because I just wanted to get, get done with it. And that is not what you want to hear from your no. lead actress in a film that you pitched that was going to change the MCU forever. That's not what you want to hear. So those are the things that you run into here so i imagine Iger is doing that slow things down that allows us to have less people so we can save money but we're also going to spend more time so these become more eventized as shannon said so well just re just a few seconds ago like star wars is doing kathleen kennedy said that at uh, her recent interview she said i want to go back to eventizing star wars and that's probably across the board that Iger's is like okay i'm back this is what we're doing this is how we're going to save both of these brands in this process and it'll be curious. I mean, the rumors, as Shannon was mentioning about what the original plan was before Kang, 
It was Robert Downey Jr. coming back as Dr. Doom. That was what they were kicking around at Secret War. He was going to show up on Secret Wars and be Dr. Doom. If that plan now comes back into motion, does that feel desperate to bring back the arch, in essence, the foundational piece of the MCU with Iron Man to kind of save your, uh, your here's, sinking ship? Here's, here's, I mean, just bringing it back to what we were talking about with Lord and Miller yeah. earlier on in the episode. Um, it's desperate if it's bad. Ah, uh, fair point. Fair point. If it's yeah. good, yeah. Like good. all ideas are all ideas are not in and of themselves good or bad. Mm. Um, their execution is what makes them good or bad. So if you tell me this amazing story and you really get your multiverse in order and you introduce the Fantastic Four and the Fantastic Four are like, oh my gosh, there's this multiversal thing happening mm -hmm. and they meet Namor and they meet, uh, you know, uh, Shuri and they kind of bring everything together. And then you reveal that in another universe, Tony Stark went in a very different direction and shows up and you're like, oh, okay. Like there's a way that you could make that where every one of us would yeah, lose yeah. our goddamn minds. Right. And there's a way that you do it which is like, you know, the Illuminati in Multiverse of Madness where oh. you kind of come out and you go, oh. okay, well, that's a thing that they did. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair point. Fair point, Michael. Uh, all right, any final words on this before we wrap up? I know we got we to gotta get going. Gentlemen, any final words on this? Any hope? Well, if Secret Invasion is good and Loki, despite the Jonathan Major stuff, is good, is that enough to kind of start turning the tide and giving people hope, do you think? No. Um, it, it'll, it'll individually, we'll all talk about it and we'll say, wow, I really liked... You know what? I mean, not to pick on DC, but I'll bring it back to DC. Like, DC had hits and misses. Yeah, true. A lot of people love Man of Steel. I know I'm not one of them, but a lot of people love Man of Steel. A lot of people think Henry Cavill was great. Most people agree that Wonder Woman was great. Yes. We would get excited about individual movies. It didn't necessarily drive towards I'm now excited about the DC universe. There's sort of the thing about these big universal, uh, sorry, not you know, these big multi movie arcs mm -hmm. is there's two stories happening. So we could go, I loved Secret Invasion. Secret Invasion is the best Disney Plus show that has come out. It was a singular thing. I loved it. We could go, I think that the Marvels was super fun. It was great. But until they get their bigger multiverse story in order, until they go, oh, here's what's happening with the multiverse, guys, and we all understand it and get excited yeah. about that, that's when they're going to be back on track. They can have a lot of individual movies and we all yeah. go, oh, their movies are getting better. We got out of that rut of Multiverse of Madness and Love of Thunder. But until we start getting back to where we were in phase three, where all of us were like, okay, guys, we know that the Power Stone is on Xandar and we know that the ether is also with the Collector, but okay, but we know, like we were all doing countdown to stones and everyone had theories oh, yeah. about what the Soul Stone was gonna be. And until we understand the multiverse as well as we understood, let's collect the stones for the gauntlet, there that's when they get back on track. Yeah, Shannon, any final words on yeah, I mean, uh, again, I think all they need, for the public at least, mm. I think all you need is one good thing. <laughs> and people are like, it's back, it's back. But but as that, all, you can lose that again yeah. <laughs> with another thing that doesn't deliver. So, you know, I think we're all kind of like, yeah, Guardians. Guardians is a lot of fun. Secret Invasion could be awesome. Um, the Marvels could be fantastic. The next thing that comes out, if Loki season two is kind of like, <laughs> It's like, oh, they've, lo they've lost their way. So ultimately, we won't know. We won't know until Secret Wars comes out if they actually are back on track. Yeah. It feels like Marvel's on the ropes after a great first few rounds. They're a little bit on the ropes right now. We'll see what happens. That's a sports uh, reference. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I get They're it. ropes that you climb, right? <laughs> that, those are the ropes, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let's get on out of here. Thank you guys so much for joining us uh, for another fun Friday uh, Geek Buddies episode. Um, uh, Shannon, what are we able to tell them? Yeah, if you'd like to follow us on social media on Twitter, it's at geek underscore buddies on Instagram at the underscore geek underscore buddies. If you'd like to follow me on social media on Twitter, it's at Shannon underscore McClung on Instagram at Shannon the Geek Buddy. If you would like to follow Mr. Vogel, it is at MK Tune. If you would like to follow Mr. Roca, it is at the Roca Says. Mikey. 
Well, like Johnny said earlier, this summer is going to be a wild ride if you are a geek. And uh, we hope that you guys are here for all of it with us. And here's what you can do to help us keep doing what we're doing. Uh, you can smash that like button below. Subscribe to Johnny's Outlaw Nation page. Like he said earlier, make sure he gets all the subscribers. Uh, leave your comments below. Let us know what you thought about this. What do you think of the state of Marvel? What movies are you excited about? What do you think about tracking? Let us know below. Um, if you are listening to us on a podcast, go ahead and leave us some stars and comments so that we go up in the rank and more people can find us. And as always, the best thing that you can do is retweet this video, post it on your social, send it to your friends, and tell them to hang out with your buddies, the Geek Buddies. There you go. All right, thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, uh, you all enjoy your Memorial Day weekend. Uh, maybe catching up on some geeky stuff or hanging out. Just be safe so you can come out and hang out with us next week when we bring you another episode of The Geek Buddies! Geek <gasps> Buddies!